Hi, Steve. Um, I really want to talk to you just briefly about uh, Perry DeAngelis, who is a dear friend of yours, and uh, just fill in some details of his life. And uh, we're trying to write more of get Perry's history down. Mm -hmm. And I think these are important because so many people knew Perry. He was so influential in um, not only in the SGU world, but I'm always running into people who are coming to the GSOW project that are telling me how important uh, the Skeptics Guide to the Universe was for them. They found um, skepticism because of it. Mm -hmm. And over and over, they will tell me how much they felt, um, you know, a kinship to Perry and how strong that was and, you know, how emotional that was. And I, so I hear that often. So, you know, I really want to try to get more of his history down. And, so you were like one of the experts. So you know, I want to find out more about him. So, okay. um, like the generic things I've heard, he was born and raised in Connecticut. That's and, correct. Okay. Yeah. In Fairfield, Connecticut. Oh, Fairfield. Yeah. Okay. And then um, he was a like. Just go ahead and tell me a little bit about his life. What do you know about him? Well, I met Perry uh, when he was in his thirties. Uh, so I only know about his earlier life from what he told me, mm -hmm. and from, you know, occasional pictures. So he did grow up in Connecticut. I know that um, he, had, he had a fairly large family. He practically raised his younger sister. There's a large gap between him and his younger sister, Celeste, and he, he was very active. In like how many years was it, like five or six, or? No, 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 it was um, well, like 15 years. Oh, yeah. seriously, okay. Uh, so, um, and in his younger days, I mean, Perry, was, his you know, personality was always just so huge. And he was interested in having extreme experiences, like just like a joie de vivre, you know, real like, just wanted to grab life by the horns and would just do anything that was, you know, fascinating and extreme and, and exciting. You know, he for a while he was Dr. Demo, which is a uh, he was a demolition derby uh -huh. player, and he developed this persona. He would always he wouldn't ever do anything halfway, so he, he of course. He wouldn't just race in the demolition derby. He created this persona, Dr. Demo, and was always larger than life. And he did that for for uh, several years. And huh. Well, Evan said it was Dr. Death. No, it was, do it was Dr. Demo. Oh, okay. That's well, my memory. Maybe you know, so who knows? He ever could be. Because you guys weren't didn't know him at that time. No, no, this is just from his stories. I know he would like sign surgical masks and hand them out after his after his races. He would drive around look for, looking for derelict cars and would offer people $100 to pull, take the car out of their driveway or oh. their lawn or whatever. Um, to, he told me all about how he rigged up the car so you have to take the battery out of the front because that's if that goes, then the car stops. And you have to put that inside the car. And it says, so you have to rig the car for the demolition derby and then, um, you know, and then you crash into was each other. Me, was he a mechanic or did he do this kind of thing? So he had people who did that. I think he, he knew, you don't, have, you don't have to act, I don't think you need mechanical skills to do the few things that you need to do to make a car ready. Okay. You know, it's kind of stuff that you could do with unskilled, let me put it that way. Was he more of a hands-on? Because the impression I got from listening to the SGU is that he was more of a thinker, an idea man, and he would come up with ideas and hand it off to somebody else to come up with and say, you executed. I think it's a great idea. Here's how we're going to do it. He certainly would do that a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, Perry, and I think that's part of our relationship, was Perry would like to come up with lots of ideas and then would ask me if I wanted to help him, you know, execute it. Um, and a lot of his big ideas never came to fruition mm -hmm. because, you know, he would, like, th so he threw a lot of stuff against the wall and, and hoped that some things would stick. I remember one idea that he had is he wanted to make a painting by suspending the canvas like over Fifth Avenue in New York and having cars drive underneath it and like with I think I remember brushes. Or, yeah, that's that's was like he's only this is the biggest, most ridiculous art project I could think of. And of course, it was never executed, but that, those are the kind of ideas that he had. And of course, you know, starting a skeptical move, a skeptical organization was mm -hmm. his idea. Um, you know, it started out as the Connecticut Skeptical Society, and I remember the, the day that that happened, he was, you know, visiting my house, and, we, you know, we, I had a subscription to the Skeptical Acquirer, in the back of that magazine, there's a list of all the local skeptical organizations, and he said, Steve, take a look at this list, what do you notice? There's nothing in Connecticut. We should, that should be us, we should start the Connecticut Skeptical Society, so it was his idea. Um, so we did. Did you, did you look at him at first, like? That's nuts. I mean, no. My, my, I think my response was that was a, that's a great idea. We should absolutely do that. I don't know why I didn't think of it myself. 
So, uh, yeah, no, it was instantly a great idea. So we did it. And, um, you know, obviously I did a lot of the heavy lifting, but Perry was right there. He, he worked on the organization. He did a lot of work. Um, you know, he was, and then of course once, this was in like 1996, mm -hmm. internet well, hadn't hit its stride yet by that time, mm -hmm. but Perry was, it was an early, you know, user, he was the kind of person that, he, like, he was on Usenet, you know, before like there was the web, you know, that he was definitely internet savvy in the early days. Um, but, so he would be great for, you know, doing internet research and, you know, adding that component to things, um, even in the early days. He didn't, wasn't really, he didn't have the skill of writing at that point, but he dove right in anyway, and so I sort of helped him, you know, develop this style of writing es skeptical essays, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's, it's not an easy skill. Um, but he did it, you know, fear, he was always fearless, you know, he never self-conscious, I mean, he, absolutely no self-consciousness whatsoever, you know. And he kind of conveyed that to other people as well, so like when you were with him, he, he had this aura of, you could sort of say and do anything you want, and it's okay. So he could get away with insulting you directly, because he would say it as if it's just a matter of fact. And like he just had this way of deflecting, like things that like, they, he took all the the emotional response out of out of it. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. he he would say things like you know like make a joke out of it. It's like yeah, that's because you know you're a filthy Democrat. That's why that is. You know. <laughs> Like just like he's stating something like that you're that's because you have blonde hair, you know, and so you, you it's just I don't know, it, 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 I can't even exactly describe what it was about the way he said things that made it so that it was okay for him to say it, and like you wouldn't get mad at him for it. He diffused he it somehow. Yeah, he just he, he diffused it exactly. Yeah, because it was coming from him, but somebody else it probably might have been offensive. Did he? So was was he also? Um, you said you had the magazine, Skeptical Inquirer magazine. Did he also already have that? And yeah, no, he knew it. Yeah, he subscribed to it. I mean, he didn't read it as thoroughly every month as I did. Um, <laughs> so I was always amazed at, uh, like, my fundus of knowledge. Like, but we were at meetings and somebody would throw a question at me, and I could just see it, you know, and go, like, how the hell did you know what they were talking about? Like, Perry, there's nothing mysterious about this. Just, I read the, you know, the journal every month. It's, it's, eventually, you come around everything. There's not that many different topics to cover. So, um, you know, he, he you know, d definitely was the kind of person who like, tried to rely upon having the big ideas mm -hmm. and wouldn't necessarily put in a lot of the grunt work, um, which I think we complemented each other well because like, he would push me sort of out of my comfort zone, and then if I thought something was a good idea, I'm, I am the kind of person who will knuckle down and do a lot of work. Um, uh, a lot of yeah, busy work. I think that's kind of your, your uh, one of your so, but it was good. Same but special it, powers. It, it was, it's, it was, Perry was good for me too, because mm -hmm. like, again, he was his idea to start the organization. I don't know that I would have thought that we could do that, but to him, he got fearlessly said, we could do that, we should do it, you know? So we were a good team, I think, in that way. Did he have any? Early influences that you know of that maybe in the skeptical world. That I, I mean, I know he was a Civil War history buff mm -hmm. and at World War II, and mm -hmm. he was very interested in Yankees and and that kind of thing. But did he have in the skeptical world? Were there people? Let me ask. Let me ask you a small question instead of this big yeah. giant die broad question. Were there people that he? What what were his, what was his favorite? Probably guest or most excited about. I think. I mean, he loved Christopher Hitchens, mm -hmm. and as you might imagine, you know because. You know, Christopher Hitchens also has that had that way of just c totally cutting to, to the chase. You know, mm -hmm. cut, right, cutting down to the nub of something, but doing it so eloquently that it kind of diffuses the situation. So Perry really admired that, and he really liked that. He Perry loved James Randi. I mean, Perry really the couple of times, especially early on in our career when we were nobodies. You know, and, and Randi was a massive celebrity in our movement. Um, but we had we were at some events with him where we got we got the opportunity to hang around with James Randi and Perry loved that because he was very impressed with him. Um, definitely a Cosmos Carl Sagan fan, so not uh, not really anything surprising there. I mean the same kind of influences, you know, that we all have. Was he uh, did, did was there somebody on the show that he was just thrilled with having on the show? Because I don't remember if he if you guys interviewed um, Hitchens or not. Did we you? we did, but Perry wasn't there when we interviewed him. But he but. Um, we interviewed Hitchens in 2006 
during our, that was 10 5, that was our first 10. Okay. So at that point, Perry was still, was already too ill really to fly. So he didn't fly with us, he didn't travel with us. Um, which was, a, that's you know, one thing we all regret. You know, we never got to go to conferences with Perry because you know, by the time we started the podcast, he was already um, you know, pretty advanced in his, uh, in his illness. So um, yeah, he, you know, it, it, it was holding him back. And you know, it also, because we've talked about this too, especially like after Perry died and looking back, you know, the Perry that we originally met was really different than what Perry was like towards the end. And because he, he, although he ne he never complained, or, um, or he never you know he never really he complained, but he never really whined. Like he would he would just say, yeah, you know, he'd make those kind of wry, sarcastic comments about his physical limitations. But it was, he never he never took it as like him complaining or whining. You know what I mean? But um, so in a way, he was extremely stoic, and he knew he was going to die too. I, mean, I could tell wow. towards the end. I mean, he knew, and he was just accepted it. Um, but not that he didn't care, but I mean, you know, he would say, was, what could he do about it? It was, it, was, it was clear to me that he had a level of acceptance. So, but early on when Perry, you know, before he got sick, he was a different person. He was much more active and friendly and outgoing, and he got cranky towards the end. You know, it was still within his personality, but he had more, he occasionally would have one of those days where it reminded us what he was like 10 years earlier. Um, but he had more cranky days than non-cranky days as he got <laughs> sicker and sicker. But it was still a joy to be around him. But it was, it was, you know, it was unfortunate too that it definitely took a lot out of him. You know, there were, and he was, um, you know, times when he was sick. Like there were times when he couldn't stand up out of a chair. What was his illness? Uh, he had um, scleroderma. Okay. So originally it was diagnosed. So he had. Um, remember, he called me. It was like eleven o'clock at night. And he said, Steve, and he would do this a lot, like he would ask me these insane questions. So Steve, I, you know, I can't breathe, what should I do? <laughs> like, what do you mean you can't breathe? He's like, well, you know, if I lay down, I can't breathe. I have to, I have to sit up. Really? He's like, well, it sounds like you're in heart failure. You know, you should go to the emergency room. You know, like, do you really need me to tell you that you need to go to the, he was looking for an excuse not to go, you uh -huh. know what I mean? So <laughs> he went to the emergency room and he was in heart failure. He would have been dead by morning. If he, if he had just tried to go to sleep, he would have, he, he would have been dead. Um, and then it turns out he had pericarditis, which he thought was hilarious because it was pericarditis. Um, and then that led to the diagnosis of scleroderma, which is you know, an autoimmune disease. And um, you know, he never, never got back to full health from that point. But I do remember at that time, um, his, uh, his rheumatologist who made the diagnosis. It took a while to get the official, they kind of knew it was something like scleroderma, but then some guy said, no, it was more of a, it was a different syndrome. I didn't really, really buy it, but it was, there was some confusion about the diagnosis. I was hoping it wasn't going to be scleroderma, but that, at the end of the day, that's what it was. And his rheumatologist said, you know, you're, at this point, average lifespan is 10 years. And that, he lived exactly 10 years. So right? it was, a, in retrospect, it was a completely accurate uh, pro uh, progno prognosis. Um, so he had problems with heart failure, his lungs weren't working well, his kidneys weren't working well, you know, just sort of his internal organs took a toll. He had trouble swallowing because the esophagus, you know, gets hardened, and his hands just slowly curled up, you know, at the end he was sort of typing like this, you know, he couldn't really uncurl his fingers. It was, you know, but he just did, just dealt with it and just pushed forward. Um, and what ultimately killed, I mean, he was having little heart attacks, and every time he did that, so, and I explained this to Perry sometimes, because again, he would ask me questions and want me to tell him the unvarnished truth. And I told him, you know, you, if you think about, you have this physiological range where you can function, you know, between your heart and your lungs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that window is closing. You know, so your this range of where you can function is getting smaller and smaller, and then that's going to get to the point where it closes, you know, and then that's incompatible with being alive, you know. <laughs> so that's, that's essentially what happened. I, I, and I remember, like, a, a, about two or three months before he died, um, he spent some time in the hospital. They took off, like, 40 pounds of extra fluid because he was just retaining fluid. He was a big guy. You know, he was a big, tall, obese guy. But, and he was, like, f like 30, 40 pounds of, of edema, of just retaining fluid because his heart wasn't perfusing his kidneys. He wasn't getting rid of it. And, they, like, over the course of a week, he lost 40 pounds of fluid. And he, he was functioning much better. I mean, he was able to walk around. 
and breathe, you know, and was able to function. We had like this window of about a month to six weeks where he was pretty functional. And then he just went downhill again. And now in retrospect, I know it's because every time he went downhill, he was having another heart attack. He lost another little bit of cardiac function. The window closed a little bit further and his, ba his best baseline got worse. And then it just sort of accelerated towards the end and eventually like in, the, in the August of that year, you know, he went to the hospital um, and just never came out. You know, he had his final heart attack where he just was not, they weren't able to get his, he actually had a cardiac arrest, you know, where his heart stopped. Um, but I actually, I was actually with him at that moment. You know, we had, I'd spent the day with my family at, with, at the Beardley Zoo and we were, drove to the hospital to, to visit with Perry um, and I went into his room just to see if he was like okay to receive visitors. So my, my wife and my two kids were outside in the hall. I went in, Perry's mother was there. Perry had just like eaten um, his dinner and he was short of breath. I thought, Perry, how come you're short of breath? Um, and he, he, so his mother was telling me, his wife had, had just left the hospital. His mother was telling me, yeah, you know, he's been short of breath like this, you know, for the last 15 or 20 minutes. I'm like, is our, our somebody coming? It's like, yeah, they're, they're coming to, to evaluate him. Um, and, uh, and then Perry, like, his eyes looked up to the left, which I, I recognized, you know, as a neurological sign. And then, you know, the heart monitor went flat, and then the team, you know, converged. Completely. And I was, you know, obviously the, his mother and I were pushed to the side, and he was resuscitated for about 45 minutes, but I knew, you know, 10 minutes in, if they didn't get him back within five, 10 minutes, that, it, I knew it was over. So at some point, I told his mother, you know, if you want to wait outside, I'll stay here. And, you know, you don't, need to, you don't need to stand here. And then uh, the physician who was in charge of the code came to me like around 40 minutes and said, you know, he's, we're not getting him back. You know, it's been more than 25 minutes. Even if we did get him back at this point, you know, his brain is gone. So like, it was looking, he was asking for my permission to stop. I said, yeah, of course. I mean, this, at this point, this so that, of course, that was you know, a devastating, you know, very sad day. We all knew it was coming, but it's still different when it happens. You know, like the finality of it happening is always devastating, even right. no matter how much you know it's coming. Now, you were always hoping maybe we can get another year out of it if we do this or that. You know, but um, you know, it is frustrating to stand by and just see that you can see the window of viability closing and just you know, and feel helpless because you know it's just really short of like a heart lung transplant or something dramatic like that there was just nothing we were just sort of managing this progressive syndrome that was incurable and there really wasn't much else we could do about it you know and I remember just, you know, just about this story the day before he died um, one of the pulmonary doctors at Yale which is the hospital where I work actually where, where he was admitted um, you know Perry and I were talking to him and you know, he was explaining what the situation was, and it was grim, you know. And Perry's like, yeah, I looked at him, yeah, it's grim. You know, he, Perry knew that the bottom line was he may not be leaving the hospital, you know. Um, so, but, you know, did, even right at the end, there was never any, you know, he, he never cried or seemed angry or seemed, he never became hysterical, never lost it. It was always just, yeah, it's grim, but, you know. Wow. Kind of reminds me of the story of uh, James Rang tells about the death of Jerry Andrus, kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. where he said that Jerry called him up on the phone and was like, so, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm here and they've got me all drugged up with different kinds of drugs and I don't really like that very much. I wish I was able to be more awake so I could experience this, because this is an adventure I've never done before. I wish I could, and I think Jerry Andrus told Randy, I wish I could take notes. <laughs> he says, what, have I, what I'm experiencing. He says, you know, it's okay. You know, I know it's going to happen and it's fine. And it's just like, still, it's emotional to us. You know, we're just like, yeah. oh my gosh, you know, that kind of thing. Well, let's try to do something a little more cheering. Okay. <laughs> tell me about his family. Is, you said he has a younger sister, but it was a big family. Can you, well, you yeah, tell he has a, a younger sister, um, a, a brother, and an older sister. Mm -hmm. And Kind of a troubled family, to be honest with so you. So he's in the middle. He's yeah. So sure. yeah. So I mean, his um, older brother uh, is developmentally delayed. Yeah. His sister was a drug addict. Mm -hmm. um, although his, you know. Um, his younger sister. No, no, older sister, sister. Older yeah. sister. Then there was Perry, and then his then the big gap, and then his younger sister was actually a good friend of ours as well. Right. Um, and and she's great. Um, she's very similar to Perry in a lot of ways. So <laughs> it's, it's fun to be friends with her. Uh, and 
you know, his, his, his parents are still together, but they had, they had troubles, you know, um, especially, again, when Perry was, was a kid. That's why you know, a lot of the responsibility to actually raise his younger sister fell to him, because the parents were a little dysfunctional for a time. Um, but, you know, they, the whole family always stayed together. There was, you know, a big Italian family, and you could tell there was a sort of baseline cohesion there. And um, I think yeah, Perry always remained tight with his family. So Perry worked for his father, actually. His right. father was in real estate, and Perry's job was basically to help manage his property. So he would you know, drive around and inspect properties and collect rent. And you know, he was involved with a lot of the business in terms of like filing papers for LLC, et cetera. So that was his job. You know, he basically would drive around and manage his father's properties, mm -hmm. um, which is good. It was kind of a, gave him a lot of freedom. You know, he wasn't like, and he wasn't clocking in nine right. to five, and his time was his own, and that was important to him. You know, he was Harry never was ambitious in terms of like making a lot of money. He just wanted to have the freedom to do what he wanted to do. You know, so that was a very, I think, optimal lifestyle for him. Was he raised um, Catholic or is it big Italian family? Yeah, I mean, his family um, is Catholic. I mean, Perry was always an atheist. Okay. I mean, unlike like me and my family, sort of. You know, I had faith when I was younger because that was what I was raised, and it wasn't until I was really, you know, in college where I would fully identify as an atheist. But with Perry, he said he never believed even the slightest bit. He was always an atheist; couldn't understand how anybody could believe. But um, he went to church. I mean, was he like told to go? Uh, you know, he never talked about. It. I don't think so. I don't think it really was um, a, a big religion. You know, that they were an intensely religious family. You know, it, a lot of sometimes you know a lot of Catholics are like the we call it the, the Christmas. Catholics, you know, oh, yeah. go to church on the holidays, but it's not really woven into like the, the day to day. But Perry's not the kind of person who would do anything he didn't want to do. Um, and he made no bones about his disdain for religion. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, obviously on the show he understood this is a science show. You know, we there has to be a scientific or critical thinking angle, and he was totally fine with that. Right from you know, and also just with the with the skeptical movement, he was Perry and I completely agreed with. The approach to skepticism that we took in the movement, which is, you know, it, we're about science and critical thinking, and we deal with any issue, even religious, as long as it overlaps with science. But we're not a religion bashing or an anti-religion, mm -hmm. you know, organization or show. And he was totally okay with that, even though he, in, personally, he was an atheist and made no bones about it. And you know, and it, to his friends, you know. Um, would just say exactly what he felt without sugarcoating it at all. Uh, he took he took great pride in the fact. One of our mutual friends actually is a Catholic priest, uh -huh. and Perry took great pride in the fact that he kept him out of the seminary for ten years. He eventually then went. You know, after his mother died, mm -hmm. he he ended up becoming a priest. But Perry sort of saved <laughs> saved him for a decade by keep delaying you know the inevitable. But. Um, <laughs> And he, you know, Perry had definitely had a huge influence on all of his personal friends. Once he decided you were in his circle, like you were a friend of his, you know, uh, he, had a, he had a huge influence, you know. Did he have, was there any interviews that he wanted to do that he would really have loved to do but he couldn't have, either because, you know, that person is no longer around or unavailable? Was there any? Um, I don't remember him, like, specifically mentioning anyone like that. I mean, we actually were, um, in terms of the SGU, I mean, you know, Perry was around until episode you know, 100, pretty much, so that's mm -hmm. like the first two years. The whole time, you know, we were enjoying more success than any of us anticipated. Mm -hmm. So it was, there was never even time for any kind of regret or anything. We were always just constantly amazed at how well we were doing, you know. Um, so, I, I just don't, I don't recall him like regretting not being able to interview anybody or he obviously would you know like all of us we we, we wanted to get big names for interviews because right. you know why not um and uh but yeah it's just no one comes to mind as somebody that he that he in particular I mean, we, we interviewed the people we wanted to interview you know he wasn't involved in the warren um investigation. oh yeah oh yeah because i i loved that story I, it was yeah. on um, was it on monster talk recently i can't Maybe, remember yeah. and, and um it was just terrific, you know, hearing about that. And uh, but he was he was involved in that. Oh yeah, he loved that. He loved that because, you know, Ed and Lorraine Warren were just characters, and Perry was like one of these people who likes loves to observe other people. Mm -hmm. Other people are fascinating to him, and the more extreme, the better. And you know, Ed and Lorraine Warren, who were the 
famous old couple in Connecticut, you know, they did the Amityville Horror, and, mm -hmm. they, and they're total cranks, you know, they're just crazy, just crazy. And it, there were, we just had endless stories and inside jokes about our interactions with the Warrens, and Perry loved that, you know, the fact that we, that they were so nuts, and we had that experience, he loved that, that, that all that investigating experience that we had. Well, I guess, I know you're a busy man. Um, is, let me ask you one more question. Is, uh, can you just tell me a little bit about Nexus and um, the relationship with Nexus and Perry? Um, so, we started doing um, shows in New York City pretty shortly after Perry passed away. And so I think it was like the first time we were invited by the New York City Skeptics to do a show. Um, we decided that would be, because it was also, it was right in August, mm -hmm. when right around, which is both Perry's birthday, um, birth month, and the month that he died. He died, I think, two days short of his, of his birthday. Mm -hmm. um, so we decided to make that the Perry D'Angelo's Memorial Lecture. And then, so every year, that we're, our New York lecture became the Perry D'Angelo's Lecture. Even when we moved it from the, you know, that time of year to the spring, mm -hmm. Uh, we moved, you know, basically that evolved into Nexus, and Nexus moved just because we were trying to position it so it wasn't too close to any other conference. We moved it to April. Uh, so we just kept Nexus as our annual Perry, Memorial Perry DeAngelis show. Mm -hmm. um, so we always, you know, take a moment to remember Perry at the beginning of every, of every Nexus show that we did. I think you would like that. Absolutely. I mean, the fact, Perry, I mean, absolutely, Perry definitely, and he, you know, expressed this to me as well. He, he wanted to have an influence, you know, and um, the fact that people still remember him, that people are listening to the show, they get his personality because it comes through loud and clear on the show, mm -hmm. that he's still influencing people, he absolutely would love that. I mean, that, that every time someone says, oh, I, you know, I feel like I have a personal relationship with Perry through the show, I know that that's something that he would really have cared a lot about. Well, he certainly is still influencing people. Yeah. He's, he certainly is not forgotten. Is there anything else that you think that I should probably, that I didn't ask you? Um, I mean, there's lots of things we didn't talk about. I know I haven't talked to you about our role-playing you know, mm -hmm. history together. Um, so I don't know if I need to go over any of that territory. Um, but there's not any other thing that you can think of that was like... That was lots of other like, anecdotes. Oh. <laughs> I mean, are, are, you know, Obviously, when you lose a close friend, it's, there's no way around the fact that it's a huge loss. Right. And one of the things that I lost when Perry died is we had a lot of shared moments together that we would always like, remind each other of. And one that, in particular, that I was fond of was we were at a uh, we were at a conference together. Mm -hmm. um, it was a um, a cult awareness conference, so mm -hmm. it was about cults. And we were we were do, doing some workshops on critical thinking, which is something they really needed because there was more. It, the cult awareness community is ma is mainly organized by by people on sort of the religion end of the spectrum, you know, and, and seeing cults as sort of a dangerous version of a belief system, mm -hmm. not so much a scientific approach. And we were and they we were invited um, because, you know, we have written about cults and it's you know, but from a more of a skeptical point of view, and they thought that would be a great addition. I, I agreed with them; it was a great comp compliment to it. And in fact, at that conference, uh, Randy was the keynote speaker. Oh. And we helped arrange that as well, which was good. It was one of the first times where we got to hang out a lot with Randy because we were at the conference together. We were the only real skeptics there. Everyone else was, you know, was more in the cult uh, community. So anyway, um, there was, I shouldn't say who it was, but there was one of the people that we knew that we were connected to at the conference who was a politician. Um, right, like in the evening, Perry and I were there with a couple of other people from our group, and um, Perry and, I, remember Perry and I were walking down the hall, and we, we ran into the politician that we knew that we hooked, that hooked us up with the conference, and he was there with some woman that he had brought to the conference. That, and um, so he introduced us to her, and she like, shook our hand. Like he said, yeah, this is Steve Novella. She shook her hand and put on the most fake face of sympathy that you can imagine. It was like, and it was like just so <laughs> over the top and so phony. Like, Perry and I almost didn't know how to react to it. And then, it, like, we didn't even know, in the moment, we couldn't even interpret what the hell was going on. And later, the only thing we could think about was that she must have thought that we were victims of cults, because that's what a lot of people there were cult victims. 
So this, she must have thought that she had to express sympathy to us because we were victims, you know. So she had having no idea who we actually were, that we were just there oh. as educators. But like we could make each other crack up at any point after that, you know, we could make each other crack up just by, you know, reminding each other of that or feigning that woman's, you know, feigned, you know, totally phony sympathy. It was funny. So we had a lot of little moments like that that we shared, you know, that was just from um, you know, doing the skeptical thing and doing everything that we did, you know. It was, it was you know, those, those Perry, you know, made those experiences a lot more fun because he was just so dramatic. One of the, like, the, one of the inside jokes we had with Perry is, um, like, I, it, and everyone may have talked about this in terms of our live action role playing mm -hmm. effect. Perry didn't sweat the small details a lot. So, when, if, um, he were telling us, like, giving us statistics about, like, what our, he was sending us out into the field as a character to entertain the players. We would say, okay, well, how many hit points do I have? And he would, his answer would almost always be per dramatic effect. Just whatever you think you need to do to make it fun and dramatic. Don't worry about the details. Per dramatic effect. So that became a Perryism. <laughs> per, per dramatic effect. That's, that's Perry's approach to life. So yeah. We have Perryisms now. Yeah. We should just make a list of them. Right. <laughs> Maybe exactly. it already exists somewhere. There's so many down. Well, thank you so much, Steve, for Thanks. talking to me. I really appreciate it. This has been very helpful. You know, this this guy is definitely in the hearts of so many people. It's good to hear. And I, I, I've been so much enjoying talking to you and Evan about him today. All right, it was a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.